is Vic Gatta. Welcome to the Hailstorm. Today I have Nancy Everett. She's the founder and CEO of HeOps and then recently has launched a new service called Centipede. We have a great time talking about healthcare in general, the COVID impact on healthcare, and then home care that now she is called rebranding Help Care. It's a great show. Please watch Nancy Everett with HeOps. Okay, welcome everyone to the Hellstorm. We're back uh, after a COVID-inspired uh, virtual setting. Uh, happy to be back in person. I have Nancy Everett with me today. Excited to, to go through this, Nancy. Well, good. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So let's start. Tell the audience, give a little bit about your background. Start with, with HeOps that you've been doing for quite a while, and then I want to hear about Centipede as well. Well, so like many here in Nashville, Vic, I am you know, born and bred, kind of an HCA, ex-Life Point person, yep. started HEOPS, and what we focused on was really helping health and you, plans. And in 04, 03? I did. actually left LifePoint in 1999. We started okay. HEOPS right after that. Okay, in 99. For, okay, good. 99, formed a C-Corp in 2004, and what we focused on were helping health plans scale. It may sound like a billion-dollar corporation doesn't need help scaling, mm -hmm. but there are certain portions of their business that they need really uh, complex things done very quickly. And that's what we focused on. Okay. So, so you were providing services to health plans. Mm -hmm. here, that's fairly unusual here in Nashville. It is. And so <laughs> talk about some of the, like, net, building out networks or are there tools like that? What it would... is. So it's interesting. So we don't have any clients in Nashville, the, yeah, the, rare, right. <laughs> the rare client in Nashville. But uh, what we found is that uh, there were health plans all across the United States, pre- and post-RFP for Medicare and Medicaid. And they're trying to build provider networks, do credentialing, do provider data, all things pretty pretty tactical yeah. and transactional. And uh, you really, it was very very short timeline. And so what we found is that we would get a telephone call and someone would say, I need 20,000 providers in Texas in 60 days. Can you wow. do it? Yeah. And so the right answer is, of course. Right, right. <laughs> sure. So, so we yeah. can do that. So that's really what we've specialized in, was really quick, complex work all across the United States. Didn't matter the provider type, didn't matter the state. So we work in all 50 states, all provider types, building networks for most of the nation, nation's largest plans. Okay, and in order to be able to meet that timeline, that, that really fast turnaround at that, at that significant scale, do you have a, a sort of a inherent database or, or, or a set of tools that help you do that? So that's a great question. It was interesting. Sometimes you don't know that you're doing something that's cutting edge until everyone else does it and they get credit for yeah. it. So back in, I think, 99 was one of our first big jobs for value options. And they okay. needed to send out uh, fax all over the state. So we built a fax farm overnight. And so we sent that out. So what we found is I have a technology background, and I always love working with other tech folks. Yeah. And so we utilized these kind of custom-built tools to deliver all types of things, whether it was e-fax, whether it was um, uh, any other type of communication, e-sign. So oftentimes yeah. we were ahead of the curve. We did data scraping before anyone did data scraping. And so we utilized all of these types of innovations to be able to scale for the health plans. The other part of that is really taking it from a communications perspective. So you have to sell something and people have to want to buy quickly. Mm -hmm. And so the other portion of that is really creating relationships very quickly to get someone to accomplish an objective. Oftentimes okay. you're building for Medicaid. And so there's no rate neg negotiation and there's no, I mean, and the rates are low. Yeah. Right. So Yeah. You have to um, convince the provider that they should want to be in this network. Absolutely. Um, and you don't have to negotiate the rates, but, but you have to talk them into take, seeing the patients at the rates that are published. Well, they do. And the great things about healthcare providers is many care about the communities yeah. they're, they're in. And so they want to be a part of the community. And so with any good business, you want to take a portion of these patients along with your other types of patients. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the pieces that we really like to, to talk to the providers about is how they contribute to their communities. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you are building these networks of different size and specialty for for the big plans. For the big plans, yes. How would you um, how would you assemble them? Is do you keep a database of what services a provider group would 
offer and then mm -hmm. you mix and match and try to deliver a full suite of services? Sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? So well, well, it sounds like uh, an asset that I haven't seen before. No, so. It's actually the national provider um, database, the MPI database. Okay, so, so you pull out, out of the, uh, so, out of the so MPI. So, the, so yeah. you download and you connect your API to the NPES database and yeah. then using the taxonomy, you can identify all the providers in the United States by specialty. Mm -hmm. So you can cut them, you can slice them, you can also scrape your competitor databases um, and their directories off of the websites. Okay. And so using all those things, you try to yeah, determine... Yeah, so then you have your own uh, internal proprietary database that combines those things, mm -hmm. and then you do outreach to, to sort of assemble the network for a particular client. Correct. Yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. And so you've been doing that for 20, 20 plus years, 22 years, something yeah, like that. It's it makes yeah. it sound like a long time. There, there, <laughs> yeah. time. there are times when we were not convinced that we wanted to do this work. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty exhausting if you, if you sound mm -hmm. as though you need 20,000 providers in 60 days. Right. So well, and providers move around and change mm -hmm. all, all the time. And so you're having to continuously keep the data clean and up to date. Correct, and that in itself is a challenge. No one's quite mastered that yet, mm -hmm. but you, you figure that 20% of your data will be dirty at any point in time. Yeah, interesting. Okay, and so that's uh, HEOPS, and then recently you've started a thing called Centipede as well. We did. So Centipede was interesting. Um, if you're familiar with Medicaid, there's a portion of Medicaid in which they have what are called HCBS waivers. And so those are where you deliver services in the home so that people can, can live their best life. And so it minimizes the um, acute care spend. So what we found is that it was really an opportunity to apply that same model to the rest of the United States. So what we did is we went out building an infrastructure. So we did what we do best is we built a provider network nationally. And so we built this now network, and then we started contracting with health plans. And so we're providing our network, and then we're now providing kind of an end-to-end -end services for those members. So, so the physician network is HEOPS, but then the extended care network into mm -hmm. the home Correct. Is, is now added on, and that, that's the centipede. It is. Services. And so we actually contract that under our own brand. So we can work with a health plan. They can mm -hmm. actually bring in the Centipede network. We delegate it from them, meaning that we've already done the credentialing to an NCQA standard, mm -hmm. and then they can just plug and play. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So, so these things now work together mm -hmm. uh, where you're doing HEOPS for plans, but then when they need or, or if they need a, a home care solution, mm -hmm. they, then you have that already pre-built for them. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. So um, talk to me about how COVID has impacted your business. Right. Uh, I think that's a great thing. We all woke up and this, this yeah, kind of, in, this in March, we nightmare. all woke up and like, gosh, and, uh, I guess, yeah. So what was really interesting is that uh, I was traveling internationally just prior to COVID hitting okay. and saw some interesting things. And I thought, wow, this you know, is the next version of SARS and we're watching Wuhan. So what I really began thinking about is that if you, if you think about COVID, only 10% of the cases are acute and remain inside of a hospital setting. The rest are less acute and they can go home. Yeah. So someone has to help care for those folks at home. So if you already yeah. take someone who's got other underlying conditions and you have a mild case of COVID, they need to stay home. And so what we knew is that our home care providers that we're working with, they didn't sign on for infectious disease. Yeah. So they didn't know what they were doing. So we thought really quickly. And they have their own risk worries and their own Correct. risk profile. Yeah. So the first thing we thought about is we need to teach them how to be safe and how to keep their team safe. So we started standing up a variety of solutions overnight. So we started doing a podcast and okay. it's, it's been pretty rough. It got better every day. <laughs> yeah. We did it every day for 60 days. Oh, wow. Every okay. day, except for Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. So Peter Coppolis is a nurse and he's my uh, co-host on that. Okay. So Peter and I did our daily briefing for the, uh, for the 60 days. We brought in a policy firm out of DC that partnered with us. And so okay. we were all on there for 60 days. And then we started moving mm -hmm. it to two times a week. Okay. And, yeah. uh, but it's really been great because we've been able to talk about not only how do you stay safe with PPE, don and doff your mask, mm -hmm. what are the appropriate guidelines, but also mental health. What yeah. are the policy changes? Because money is really important. If these agencies can't stay fiscally sound, they're going to close. Mm -hmm. And so it was really interesting that that podcast evolved during that time frame. And so we also found that they couldn't find PPE. So I began sourcing yeah. PPE. Yeah. And so like everyone else, and then we began augmenting the cost of the PPE because our providers didn't have funds. Yeah. 
Okay, so there's a lot there. So, so uh, <laughs> the first thing is that your, your I keep calling it home health, but the home care providers, home care. that includes home health, but also would include other things that are not clinical in nature. Correct, yes. They had to quickly learn about COVID, and the need went up dramatically, right? Like you, you had to provide a lot more services because more people were home, more people were in need of services, and yet the providers, all the folks in the field and the agencies that support them that you work with, didn't know what was safe and not safe and how to interact. And so the, the first thing is, is you had this podcast that was educating folks on what to do and how to approach it. But then it sounds like you grew from there into both a business advisor and, and a procurement source. Um, let's talk about the business advisor first. You mentioned mental health, but then we're talking about the business sustainability, which right. of course are interrelated but I think are somewhat different. Well, they are. So think about this. So if your team is overwhelmed, uh, when they're caring for a COVID patient, it's very intense, and they're afraid of bringing this home to their family as well. Yeah, so let me just unpack that. So it is a, it's an agency, and let's just say they're in Middle Tennessee, where we are here. Mm -hmm. They have how many, how many home care workers? And they could have hundreds. Um, yeah, so, so like 200, 300, yeah, so I, I would say a large agency is going to have probably around 100, 150 providers. Okay. Okay. And so is that the team you're talking about? Yeah, or so, is it the internal team? Yeah, so it's, it's their team. So, it's, okay. so what, what you find is that they could be, it could be a, a one-man agency, a hundred-man agency. So their skill sets are really variable. Mm -hmm. And so that was the part that was interesting. Some had resources, some had no resources. So we were trying to make sure that it was relevant for everyone. And no one was talking about, no one wanted to talk about what was happening inside the home. It wasn't quite as sexy what was going yeah. on inside of the hospital right. and all of the ventilators. Yeah, but, but there, there was... Nine out of 10 COVID patients were sent home, and many of them needed home care services before COVID. And then, so of course they need services mm -hmm. still. And an agency with 100, 150 home care workers needs to know how do I protect my workers? How do I advise them? Is it safe for them to go in? Say they have asthma. Can they go deliver this work or is it not safe for them? Right. And so what was really interesting during the, the public health emergency is that there was a lot of there was an opportunity for many of these agencies to start doing some work using telehealth. So yeah. that's another big topic. And so part of that was also helping them identify how do I stratify my patients so that I can look at their risk and make a determination. Yeah, because some know. of them would benefit from telehealth. Some of them, they, they some need hands too on. Acute. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. someone needed shore services, uh, activities of daily living, and needed to go in and help them. But yeah. if they just needed other types of assistance, you might be able to utilize telehealth. Okay, interesting. So, so you were teaching how to go about that. Are there best practices now that... that Centipede has established or that HEOPS has established? Well, a combination. So there's, okay. there's, there are processes that we developed, and I'm going to say we loosely because Peter Coppolis and my team developed all okay. of those. Yeah. And then also following the CDC guidelines, wanted to make sure that we were in check with what the best in practice was at that time. Mm -hmm. So we've developed some proprietary pieces, and then we also integrated the CDC because we wanted to be uh, consistent information. Pulling something off of Facebook or Yahoo is probably not your best uh, course yeah. of, of action. So we find someone, I saw this on X site and said, you know, let's go back to the real sources so that we can be safe. Yeah. And then a daily podcast, I mean, I, I do this not daily, and it's a lot of work to prepare yes. and, and be on every day. So what was that experience like? So again, thank God for Peter. Uh, what I can tell you is that he was writing uh, two to four hours a day and just yeah. to prepare the slides from a clinical perspective. And so the, I, oh, I so would you had presentations and things. We on, did. So yeah. it, was, it, was, wow. it was a full you day. You see my every beautiful day. Exactly. presentation so we, <laughs> of a white screen. Yeah. <laughs> so we had, a pure, we, had a pure, we had a deck every day that yeah. was unique. And so we were developing, uh, we had the policy updates coming in every day and, and the, with the group ATI advisory out okay. of DC. Right. Peter preparing clinical updates and I would prepare all of the business updates and the analytics around yeah. that. And so it okay. was, it was, it was, it was a full-time job yeah. during that time frame. but it was, yeah. once again, you have to make a choice. What's the best thing that we can do for the industry? And it was to help these folks stay mm -hmm. safe. Yeah. And, and what's the brand name of that? Or how would people find that, that show? 
Yeah, so it's the it's called the COVID the COVID nineteen daily briefing, but it's okay. not daily anymore. Right, right. Uh, so, so it's continuing to to evolve again. So it's now just the briefing, uh, but it was. Okay. And so we do make it available. We publish it out there uh, for some individuals. They can go to our LinkedIn page, um, Centipede Care Solutions, and okay. find the so, links. So if they go to Centipede Care Solutions on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. they can then navigate from there. Yep, you can navigate and you can sign up to be yep. on the list. For us, we didn't limit this to our providers. We wanted to make it available to everyone that was out there mm -hmm. uh, that wanted to come in and needed the knowledge. We were surprised at the lack of, um, uh, I would say, of activity and assistance that the home care providers nationally were receiving. So they were struggling, yeah. but we had all kinds of organizations calling, said, I'm on your briefing, love it. Um, you know, over 40 to 50% of all of the briefings that we sent out were opened. Yeah. So it was, it was you know, some really good yeah. numbers. Um, I mean, maybe it's surprising. Yeah. I think home care has been ignored for a long time. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's that surprising to me. Maybe it's sad, but mm -hmm. uh, um, the acute care hospital space gets all the attention. And, you know, that, that maybe um, maybe that was right originally. But but home care now is, is really an emerging huge opportunity that needs to be addressed. Well, if you think about it this way, most of most conditions can be treated in the home. So I think that there's an opportunity for a redefinition of healthcare and how healthcare is treated. Yeah, I I agree completely. So let's, that that's a good segue into a sort of a discussion around COVID and sort of the health storm, right? So so the 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 premise of this show is that there's kind of a bold prediction that I had last year that a storm was going to come. You know, disrupt the healthcare industry. I didn't at all expect it to be a global pandemic, <laughs> um, but I was kind of watching um, the prevailing winds, or watching trends beginning to emerge, and feeling like they were going to come together in this in this storm-like disruption. Mm -hmm. And then, sort of, COVID hit and it accelerated all of that, and really has forever changed. I think the healthcare landscape. We've been so busy with the public health crisis, people haven't really focused on it yet, but I think that the storm has come. Like It's here now, and we are dealing with the disruption, and we're also seeing the opportunity out of that. And so there's really four trends that, that I was watching last year that now are, are with us, um, but the um, care moving out of the hospital into the neighborhood and the home is, is one of the four big trends that, that mm -hmm. I was watching that I think has come now that, that fits with your home care thing. Um, the other pieces are, I think, technology is, is increasing pretty dramatically and helping with better diagnostics, better understanding of disease progression, and better, better abilities to deliver care, like in telehealth, for instance. Um, I think another trend that, that we're seeing is the rise of the consumer. So again, this plays into to home care a little bit, but consumers are sort of standing up and wanting to take control of their own health, and they are being forced to, to pay for it. And there's a lot more responsibility coming on to the individual, um, and yet there aren't, there aren't enough tools to help consumers navigate that. And so that's that's the third trend, and then the last is that there are there's new entries in the space, right? So non-traditional healthcare mm -hmm. companies like Walmart and Apple and Amazon that we never considered as healthcare companies, but now they are jumping into the space and mm -hmm. really trying to bring solutions. So so these four trends, you could see them kind of on the horizon last year. And I started the show called The Hell Storm with the idea that there was this hurricane-like storm coming and we should batten down the hatches and kind of be ready. Uh, and then, of course, COVID came and, and accelerated all those things. Um, talk about your view of these trends particularly as they relate to, to your business. So it's interesting. So you talk about battening down the hatches. I want yeah. to put up a sail because I want to move a little faster. Yeah. Okay. So it's one of the interesting things. So I, I agree with your trends. And I think the other piece that I brought up is that I think there's also a redefinition of what health 
and healthcare should be. And so that's been an interesting discussion that we started having with some of the Medicaid directors a few years ago. And I said, at what point does health begin? Because if someone doesn't, if someone has food insecurity and that leads to malnutrition, which leads to other disease, is that not the root cause? Yeah. And so does health start here? So I think until we actually began to broaden that definition of what health is, maybe we're not getting to the root cause of why some of these things are. So I think that you talk about these other entrants. So yeah. I think that's good. But I also think about it's, a, it's an openness around some of the ideas about how we're defining healthcare or health yeah. or life. Yeah, that's, that, I think that's interesting. So the, the, the language in, in the healthcare industry is very convoluted and hard to understand. Right? So, so I, I have been thinking a lot about we need to – take a page from Madison Avenue and like advertising and marketing mm. and try to help consumers, help patients just at least understand what's happening and then give them steps they can take to make positive change. And mm. I, I worry that the healthcare establishment, and we, you know, we're in one of the centers of it here in Nashville, those folks have made a living for a long time by creating very complicated structures um, that are technically, academically accurate, but very confusing to folks. Right? So, so I'll take uh, social determinants of health. Social determinants of health is a great concept that if you explain it the way that the literature would explain it, is super confusing and sounds kind of depressing, <laughs> right? Like social determinants, see, even when you say S-T-O-H, it's, it's overly complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm trying to advocate for health drivers because people understand that, like things mm -hmm. drive my health and access to fresh food mm -hmm. will automatically make me healthier, period. So right. like, I, you know, my, my boys can understand that. They don't have to get a PhD in healthcare to understand <laughs> that. And we should communicate with people so that they understand that access to food that is healthy just makes you, makes you healthier yourself. Whether you choose to eat it always or not is a different thing. Um, but just having the, the appropriate choices there automatically drives your health more positively. And then the other thread of that is to try to look at the glasses half full. And so instead of saying you are going to really suffer and not be healthy if you live in a food desert, that's mm -hmm. certainly true. But it, it's kind of a, it's just negatively framed true. versus trying to point out that if we provide healthy options, people will automatically be healthier. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about what you're seeing out there in the industry around these topics and are people beginning to redefine healthcare? Well, part of it comes down to what's paid. And so yep. everything comes down to money. And sure. so if we understand what if, you know what people will pay for, that was my, my original question to one of the Medicaid directors. I said, at what point will you start paying for this? Because until we can pay for food, until we can pay for housing, then it remains outside the loop, but I can get an extra MRI or I can get something else yeah. that I may not need. So, so we haven't really aligned our financial drivers mm -hmm. to, to allow what I'll call the root cause yeah. to, to move into place. So I think that's a, a, a kind of a question. I do see some positive movement at the government level and the recognition because it costs a whole lot less to, to give someone healthy food than it does to put the you know, very expensive acute admission. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things is that let's do the smart things on the front end so we don't have the back end complexity. And so I think that's the discussion that we're seeing right now. I'm really excited. CMS put out that there were some additional innovation models coming through. So health plans with Medicare Advantage over the last couple of years, they can yeah. now begin integrating new things. So I think that the plans are having the, the freedom to begin implementing smart things as opposed to really what was just regulated, which was more of the same. Yeah, I think that's right. It, it also is, uh, it's a big ship and moves pretty slowly, mm -hmm. right? So three and a half trillion, 300 million people, it, it's probably not appropriate to sort of change on a dime, but we have to get changing, right? Like it, it's been too slow. And the, I think you're talking about sort of the, 
the reimbursement structure, we, we have traditionally paid for every procedure, mm -hmm. and that, that encourages people to do more procedures. What it is, think about it this way. It's also a lobby, right? So we have some pretty powerful lobbies okay. around those who have a significant amount of money and infrastructure, hospitals, long-term yeah. care. Yeah, built these so, buildings, so fill them up. So, yeah. you know, so as long as we're continuing, so that, that's the challenge. And being here in Nashville, I, I know it's, sometimes it's a provocative statement saying that we need to move all, we need to move as much health care as possible out of the hospitals. And yeah. so think about how do we keep people healthy and happy at home? And so that's really, that's a transformational strategy is beginning to look at how do we redefine where healthcare starts? And then how do we really create an ecosystem that supports people to live their best life at home? Yeah, so I was talking to another guest uh, a week or two ago about um, this reimbursement strategy, and, and he gave an, an analogy that I'm now stealing, which is we kind of have a foot in, in two canoes. Mm -hmm. like we, have, we have begun the, the value-based reimbursement, mm -hmm. and that is exciting and aligns interests. Mm -hmm. And so we have a foot in this canoe, but, but we also still have a foot in the in the fee for, you know, procedures. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to have a foot in two canoes. Like we almost <laughs> need to like just to jump into right. let's align incentives and tell hospitals and doctors and plans and healthcare workers at the home, we are aligning your care to keep people healthy. Mm -hmm. And we understand they'll get sick and need acute care procedures at times, but but that's negative for them and negative for you. If you can keep them healthy, you'll make more profits. Uh, we're kind of halfway now. We're kind of halfway, but we're seeing some new models, a new uh, direct contracting entity mm -hmm. model from yeah. CMS, brand new. And it, you'll start to see more of the medical groups taking on that whole risk corridor for that. Mm -hmm. So that's a good scenario, you know, everything in one canoe. Yeah, right. And so, right. so we're all in one canoe with that, and I think that that canoe is a chance of, of getting to the right place because they're yeah, I mean the, the, they're, they're the, accountable. The full risk, uh, let's pay people based on the number of population they have. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm sort of referring to as value based reimbursement. That that's the only canoe at the end of the day that's going to be sustainable. But we have to somehow get there as a society. We do. And then you think about the sophistication in different parts of the United States, rural versus urban, and some there's challenges. So yeah. I think there, there are pieces of this where it makes sense right now and others where we need to learn some lessons that we can then help others along through the process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's probably right. As a VC, you know, I am always impatient. Like, <laughs> it's time to bring change and let's, let's set mm -hmm. about it. But I think it, it, we do need to sort of do it at the the right pace for the community where it is. We do. This is interesting. So yesterday we went live with EBV, Electronic Visit Verification in Virginia. So okay, it's a yeah. fraud, waste, and abuse scenario. And we prepared for a year and a half. And it was one of those things that you, you can't move so fast as your provider's yeah, can't, can't keep make up. the jump. Right. Because again, it was the same individuals that were inside of this pandemic trying to deliver home care and now yeah. doing a new technology. So I think there's there's some you know some mindfulness as you introduce these new pieces. Mm -hmm. People can only digest so much at a time because when you begin to change their entire business process and their care protocols, it's a lot. Yeah. You're relearning sure. your business. Um, okay, I want to talk to you about timing of things. So so uh, I've been trying to map out the COVID um, kind of how it's going to propagate out into the future. You, you've been looking at it and, and doing a podcast daily yeah. about how it's proceeding. So um, the, the framework that I've been trying to work through is there's, there's sort of a crisis recovery and new normal. So mm -hmm. there, there, there has been the crisis. Maybe we're still in the crisis. Hopefully we are beginning to get a handle on it. There's a lot better therapeutics now. The fatality rate is coming down. It's not where it needs to be, but it's mm -hmm. getting much better. The incidence of new disease is not where it needs to be, but hopefully that will come. I'm, I'm optimistic, so I'm going to say we are beginning to see the crisis get better. But then there's going to be a period of recovery where like, we've had all of this chaos and crisis and public health emergency and those so there'll be a period of sort of 
gathering things back together and recovering. And then I think there may be a new normal where we come back to a different world than, than we started with, you know, last, maybe last January before this all happened. G give me your sense of, of, is that even the right framework? And then how do we know when we make these transitions? Like how do we know when we start recovery and we get to the new normal? I think that's a great question. So, you know, we've been talking about this on an ongoing basis. So one of the things that we're seeing is that it's, it, there's so much planning. So let's let's take about think about are we in crisis? We're still in crisis. And yeah. we know we really don't forecast we're going to be out of crisis till close to the end of the year. Um, until we start getting even better therapeutics than what we have, vaccinations. Yeah. Uh, and and there's been many not many, there be two, three, four, five vaccines. Correct. But the early signs that I'm hearing, which are rumors, right? But they're, they're going to be okay. Maybe mm -hmm. Some are going to need booster shots. Right. Some will be temporary. There'll be vaccines that we can celebrate, but, but it's not going to be uh, a, a sort of panacea that fixes everything. Right. So there is no magic bullet. Yeah, right, right. So right. I think that's the one thing that we recognize. So the thing that that's really positive I see right now is people are focused and we're seeing better behaviors in the public. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we're, I think we're cognizant, that's one thing that we can do as Americans. Yeah. You know, we can socially distance. We can not put ourselves in situations that would create more spread. So I think it's looking at doing the right things, but also addressing what right. other things can we do and then how do we address this going forward. So it's, I'll take from the home care perspective. The one thing that we've seen is that we think the agencies are growing in sophistication. So they now know how to handle themselves inside with an infectious disease. Yeah. So the next pandemic, we're better. Yeah. Um, better planning for PPE. One of the things I'd love to see more of is more innovation around PPE. So there are more things to reusable. So I yeah. think that once again, you've got to have a good stock. It shouldn't go up. The pricing shouldn't be what it is. So as long as we're able to start a better planning process, we recognize now this isn't the last pandemic, Vic. Right. So as long as we know that we have another pandemic that will come, but we should be able to better respond. And, and right. you know, we, we don't maybe not, I don't know that we'll have to shut down the country, but maybe, you know, it's, it's really it's really fine lines on how do you contain this? Do we have good contact tracing, you know, contain that spread? Yeah. As opposed to where we are right now. Yeah. OK, interesting. And then do you agree with the concept of the new new normal? When like I'll take telehealth, for instance, like mm -hmm. I don't think we're putting that back in the bottle. Right? Like you at, there were during covid. Mm -hmm. It wasn't safe to go to the to the doctor, and so we 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 quickly as a society cut through all the regulatory morass and created reimbursement structures to get providers paid, as we should have done years ago. Mm -hmm. But leave that to the side. We we fixed that right away, mm -hmm. and providers all of a sudden could could deliver care when it was appropriate over telemedicine, and be paid for it. And so it's better for the patient, better for the doctor. It was, it was beautiful. Fortunately, we had to have a crisis to make it happen. But I don't see it going back. Like, even when it's safe to go to my doctor, so I, I'm at, at a HCA facility, um, I'd rather not go down there, find a parking space, go up to the eighth floor, wait in a lobby with a bunch of six people. They don't have COVID, but they're not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, when I can see the doc for seven minutes online and save all that hassle, I'm not going back. I don't think a lot of patients are going back. No, I think that's the great thing about that. No, telehealth's not going back yeah. in the bottle. But I think we also need to expand the definition of telehealth. Before, it had to be both audio and video. So question mm -hmm. for you. What do you think people over the age of 70, do you think they want to be on video or do they no, only want audio? I don't audio? want to be on video. No. So the thing that we have to think about is so telehealth needs to be right for the individual. So we find that a recent study just showed that the, the seniors don't want to be on yeah. video with their doctors. So if we can give them the other options. So I think there's still some flexibility that yeah, we need to look at. And my primary care doc, he said to me, he's a character, he said, I've been doing telemedicine for 20 years. Right. I should never have paid for it. Right, so he does phone support and email support, and you know he knows his patients well, and he has all the data, and so he can make a pretty good assessment and often give it give medical advice, mm -hmm. um, full just just audio only. Now it's because he knows his patients and he's seen them in the past, 
but I, I think there are many times when audio is is perfectly sufficient. Mm-hmm. And we we saw that with home care uh, agencies. Mm-hmm. Most did not have video based uh, telehealth, but they could do a lot of work remotely utilizing the telephone. Yeah. So it was very effective, and it saved time, money, cost, kept people safe. Right. So I agree with you. I don't think it's rolling back, and I don't think it needs to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so l- let's talk about home care because uh, you're really an expert at it, and I'm interested in it. So. Um, Care is moving out of the hospital into the home. Every person would like to age in their home and stay in their home. And if they need health care, they'd prefer to have it in their home. So everything from recuperating from an operation to IV therapy to dialysis, almost every procedure, I think, the patient would be happier and it would be less expensive to do in the home. Now, the thing that prevents that is that many of these procedures, one needs support. You need other people to help, and there's different licensing levels and different different uh, service levels. Talk to me about what you see as sort of in that space. Um, how how can we get home health workers to to sort of meet that need? Yeah, I think it's so. This is another term that I like to talk about. I call it help care. Okay. So, so we really start to think about people need help in their homes, and so it may be personal care services. It could be somebody coming in to make home modifications. It could be somebody bringing in meals. There's a whole host of services. Yeah. So, I think that's that. There's there's an end to end opportunity to create this support network, and that's really what we've been trying to do is to make sure it's easy. Yeah. So, when you have a thousand, yeah. So, Centipede is beginning this where you you mm-hmm. are starting to now say this agency is really good at this level of service, but then they, they need to be augmented with a, with another agency that has a different level. They could, be, they could be augmented by another agency or other services. So one of the challenges I see in the marketplace today, everybody's coming out with these what I'll call micro solutions. I, I solve a sliver, a tiny mm-hmm. sliver of the, of the scenario. So it's hard when you have to, to smash up a thousand slivers. Yeah. Um, instead of more of an end-to-end solution. So that's a piece of this. Of Particularly as it. an employer or the federal government or a payer mm-hmm. or a health system, they, they don't want to have a thousand uh, small micro vendors. Right. They, they need to just contact with Centipede overall. And they, you can bring Thank it you, all. Vic. Yes, that's yeah. it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so part of it is making it, because we call it to fatigue. So health plans get fatigued by dealing with small solutions. Mm-hmm. You can deal with a few, but you can't deal with so many because you don't have time to, to yeah. run your business. Yeah. Um, talk to me about how you can help bring the workers to a place where they can make a living and they're enabled, um, because one of the advantages is it's less expensive, um, but that then causes an issue where we're not paying these workers very much. Right. And so you're in the middle of this, like what, what is fair and how can you create a kind of a, a honorable, respectable job to be a, a home, home care worker well, or a health care worker? Well, I think this comes back to your canoe, Vic. Okay. Is that if we had a canoe that it could take on the, the, the full risk bundle, then yeah. we could do more and we could pay these valuable workers more. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a piece of it is that you're going to have to. But if all you're doing is you're the downstream and everything's managed by reducing revenue to these workers, that's how we're going to save money. We're going to pay yeah. you less. Right. Well, that doesn't really work. Right. Um, and so I think that's where we've been. They've all they've you know very few have received you know increased reimbursement over time. We've seen it during the PHE. Yeah. But uh, I think that's a piece. Taking the ability to take risk on some of this, pay your home care workers well. They are professionals and they're very talented. So that's yeah. the piece and that it's we. A hard, yeah, it's a and hard, it's hard job. work. So right. if you've got someone has personal care services twenty four hours a day, that's a, that's that's a tough yeah. coordination right. for those agencies. So I think that's a piece of this is giving the agencies an opportunity for value based. Yeah, be they, a game changer. So so we we made an investment in uh, the diabetes care coordination space, really around diabetic foot, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a really hard side effect of diabetes that people lose, unfortunately, get their foot amputated. And so we we provided a a service. It was really a a foot massage and nail service um, 
to older folks with, with diabetes um, as a way to kind of hide. Uh, we're going to check your feet and make sure you're okay. Because if I say we're going to prevent you from getting amputated, that's super scary. <laughs> right? Well, if I say I'm going to come give you a foot massage, to, okay, that, that sounds like I'll, I'll take that. Right. Um, and, and what we found is that just kind of like you're saying, they end up being um, almost a part of the family or like clo really close with the, the patients. And then they get pulled into all kinds of other stuff. Like I can't, I can't find a ride to my doctor's appointment next week. I don't know what to do. And then we're just chatting. Mm -hmm. But then our, our employee could, could then call back and sort of figure out a way to, to mm -hmm. it was paid for by the payer could figure out a way, okay, they're not going to make it to their appointment. Let's try to f coordinate something for them. Yeah. And the payer has solutions, but they just weren't well coordinated. They're right, and that's the piece, though. Is if, so the, the, the plans will be challenged with coordinating, again, mm -hmm. micro solutions or micro overlays. They, yeah. have to be, they have to fit together. And someone has to be focused on that. Your care manager is really not going to be the person that's going to be trying to coordinate all of these pieces. Right. They're thinking about the bigger picture for the patient. Yeah, and so if you look at... Um, preventing one diabetic patient from getting their foot amputated, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so if we could then take that value and say like this group of, of help workers is, is gonna be critical in saving that, we should, we should pay them appropriately to make sure mm -hmm. that we have the best people doing that. And we have enough available because there's a lot of people that need in-home care. And I think this is interesting. I've seen some tech solutions where we're just going to pull people off the street and we're going to pay them. Well, the challenge is if you don't know what you're doing in someone's home, then you're going to create harm. Yeah. Well, and the people that would opt into that low pay, no, no real mission behind it, maybe aren't the best people that you want in your home taking care of your mom. That's how I was thinking about it. Like, do I want this service in my mom in Minnesota? Um, you know, yes, if it is organized well and they have training and they are caring for her like I would care for her, or maybe better, probably better than I would care for her. <laughs> uh, but maybe not if they're signing up for for an app and then getting getting paid six bucks to go go check it off. Okay. Well, I think there's another piece that, that that we're missing a lot, and that's something called credentialing. Yeah, so right. there's a different level of, of validation and verification because if someone's going to see my mom, I want to know a whole lot about them right. before they go in that home. And so that's one of the things I'm seeing with some of the movement in the marketplace right now is we're mm -hmm. moving out solutions, we're doing things, but we're still we're not necessarily dotting the I's and crossing the T's mm -hmm. on the back end. Yeah, yeah. So there's a balance, right, of of having different levels of credentialing, but making sure that you know, okay, when we are sending someone into this home. That they, they have the they have the appropriate level of training. Level of training, sex offender validation, all types of scenarios that you yeah. want to be very cautious because you have you have vulnerable individuals in those homes. Yeah. And so I think of it the same way you do. Is it you know if this is my mom that I yeah. want the right the right people going in? Yeah, interesting. So so you have um, you have bootstrapped uh, heops <laughs> and centipede. Uh, you have not taken my money or any venture money. And so tell me where you see it going that's really impressive to, to sort of build two businesses mm -hmm. without raising money. W where do you see it headed? How, what is Centipede going to turn into um, mm -hmm. so, over time? So a couple of things. One, we've had venture money, but it, the, the pound of flesh was too great at the time. Yeah. So you understand that, You were the, the, right? right? the wrong firm, but I understand. Um, yeah. So I think the other thing, the other part of it is, you know, is it, was it mindful? So part of it, it's not always the same journey for women and minorities as it is for other entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not always that uh, you didn't necessarily want or need it. It's that it may not have been available or offered. Yeah. So I think that's a, there's a reality out there that I think we're still trying to address in the venture community today. Yeah, so let's, let's talk through that. Because I think that is a big issue, particularly in healthcare, where I play, mm -hmm. is that um, women and minorities, but particularly women, they are often the caregivers or the organizers of all the healthcare services for a family. And in that role, they often see things that need to be fixed, mm -hmm. they see opportunities. 
And those are the best entrepreneurs, right? They understand and have lived through the challenges. And then they get frustrated and just say like, this is a huge thing, I have to try to fix it. And so it seems like the venture community needs to realign ourselves to support that and find ways to, to support women and minority investors. So, so we are going to be launching a black founder, black health, black wealth focused fund. Um, we don't have a women's fund right now, but maybe we should start one. But what, what is your opinion of how this should play out over time? Yeah, I think that there's a, a greater sensitivity. A, a funny one, someone I was pitching, and someone said, uh, well, you know, do you have, how's, how effective from a capital efficiency? And I said, well, considering we've never had an opportunity not to make money for 22 years, I would say we're pretty darn good yeah, with managing right. a dollar, right? Everyone so, is bootstrapped <laughs> by definition. So is very efficient. He said, well, aren't you bigger? And I said, well, you want, every day you're, you're survival and growth, survival yeah. and growth. So, it's, it's, so it's a, that's a, a scenario. So you ask, what is the future? Well, I think one of the things you have to look at it. So on the centipede side, for us, that's a huge play. Mm -hmm. And I really see that's the future of, of where we're going. Yeah. And so, you know, what I really left HEOPS for was really, it was a, a bootstrapping uh, mm -hmm. opportunity so we could generate free cash flow on an ongoing basis yeah. and just send it over there. But I do, I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I think we all have to be uh, aware of, Vic, is how do we support our female and our minority um, founders? And so we have some very talented ladies right here in Nashville who have not taken capital. And I, again, it wasn't because they didn't necessarily want yeah, it. It was right. because yeah, it went to their colleague. Uh, so I think those are some of the things. But I think just the conversation right now, the more that we can all do to be better allies, to talk about things, mm -hmm. to be sensitive, maybe ask the same questions of all of the entrepreneurs, not the ladies' questions and the gentlemen's questions. Yeah. I, mean, okay. I think, I think uh, yeah. so, so at Jumpstart, we went to, for our own purposes, we went to an application thing that, that's a... It's a it's online, but it's a written application, and then we have an automated kind of algorithm-based scoring thing that, of course, doesn't doesn't bring bias, right? Cause it's 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 designed, and then the computers don't don't worry about the tone of voice of the person answering, um, and so that that's been great because it because it then screens down from I don't know four or five hundred to the top 50, and then Eller and myself, so we have a woman managing director, Eller and myself uh, are sort of sifting through those 50, and what is really, of course, obvious, but no other VC has it, is that out of those 50, there's a over-representation of minority and women, because they're really good. And, and if you mm -hmm. go kind of blind to it, and literally just like have it no one is grading it except computers uh, sifting through this, then you end up, it over-indexes the, compared to the population. Um, and that, that's great, but as you move into the more traditional VCs, unfortunately, it's a bunch of old white guys that, that are the partners, mm -hmm. right? And, and they often are finding deals through their personal networks and their fraternity buddy from 20 years ago sends them a deal. And so that is reinforcing the, just kind of the, the networks and the biases mm -hmm. in a way that's hard, kind of hard to break. And so I, I don't know the best way to, to fix that, um, except to try to promote women into be venture partners. Mm -hmm. And then we're doing a, a black only fund um, because the minority attention is really bad. So women is, is bad, but minority is, is really bad. It is. Um, and so I think that's a great thing. So, you know, giving folks the seat at the table mm -hmm. and giving them the opportunity to help direct that. I agree with yeah. you. So there have to be more people at the seats that are, that are handing out the, the deals and the, and the cash flow. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think there's a structural thing that... Um, it's just hard to see from the outside, but a lot of VCs, they need to deploy 10, 20, 30 million dollars into a company, and, and there needs to be kind of a, a structure that can absorb that money very quickly, and not all business models are designed that way. And that's probably healthy, right? Like, not, not a lot of businesses should take 10 million dollars and burn it in 18 months. 
Um, but that's helpful if you're trying to deploy a billion dollar fund that that's sort of sure. what you need. Um, so l- luckily, uh, I left that world to start Jumpstart um, with Marcus. You know, so my co-founder is black, and then the first hire was a woman, Eller. So we we have uh, tried to run away from that, but that's the VC business is a challenge. In that um, but but forget all that. Where is Centipede going to uh, bring solutions to to the space? I mean, that's going to be a really impactful. So, nationwide solution, potentially. So we're actually really excited. So we're, we're in the process right now. We're working already in the public sector space, Medicare and Medicaid. We have mm-hmm. 50,000 lives in Virginia. So yeah. we're managing a contract with Optimus and Terra Health, and we're looking to grow that yeah. portion in the Medicaid space. But we're actually getting ready to launch our direct consumer here in Nashville. Oh, good. And okay. so it is. It's called Life Coordinated, Changing Healthcare to Healthcare. And so it's a membership program. People can sign up for it. They work with their own uh, care advisor. And anything that you need, the care advisor coordinates the end-to-end for you. Okay, so I would opt in to be a member, and then all my care needs for myself or my is it extended family or just you well? Know? So it's typically for the person. So let's okay. say that you may okay. sign your mom up. So okay. let's yeah. let's think about this. So you you're concerned about your mother. I would sign my mom up yeah. because I want to be a, a good daughter, and I don't yeah. have the time to be a good daughter. Right. So sign up, and mom needs someone to. Yeah. Um, she needs personal care services. She may need a couple of services. Maybe she just wants to fix her bathroom, and the, the workmen overwhelm her. So we would utilize one of our folks. We'd send somebody out there to evaluate her home, and then help her get the right quote and then project manage that for her okay so the membership includes all the coordination of different level agencies and then the pro- like getting bids and then the, the yep. project management it does. Yeah. So we talk about the term healthcare. So really, I don't need I don't need an app. I really need someone to, to figure it all out, and right. I need someone to coordinate yeah, it. Yeah, learning me. another app so, maybe isn't the thing. So here's an app, and I said, great, you can use it. I don't want to use right. it. So most people don't want to spend all their time on their app unless they're mm-hmm. a certain age range. Yeah, right. People want help, and so if I could tell you, this is the person who's going to do good work for you. This is an appropriate price because we've already priced it nationwide. Mm-hmm. So you, you don't feel as though you're going to get taken advantage yeah. of. So peace of mind. What are the services? And I tell you what, if things go wrong, we'll have the hard conversations mm-hmm. because you really don't want to have the hard conversation. Yeah. And, yeah, so, and maybe you have enough buying power where you can have a hard conversation that would be more impactful than, correct. than a one-off person would have. So the interesting thing is, and we'll take home modifications, so people need to prepare their bathroom. So mm-hmm. I could tell you, almost down to the job, what it should cost. So if someone comes in and it's 5000 I said, really? I said, if you look at this, this actually should cost $2,200 because here's your materials cost and here's your yeah, labor cost. Yeah, you've seen it done 40 times, and so you know pretty much what it's going to be. What it should be. Yeah. And so the rest of that is markup. But not everybody lives in a million-dollar mansion. Some people have modest homes, and so not all of the work needs to be at the same type of esoteric finish level. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah. that's a piece of it as well. So people need to, you know, they need good work at a fair price. And you need yeah. to know that it's a fair price and someone to, to help you coordinate that. And so that's really the piece that we're looking at is that if you're not ill, it's okay. You can still use the health care to get ready to stay in your home. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have some challenges or need to get to the doctor and you need transportation, you can call your care advisor and they'll make sure that you get somebody coordinated. So the membership fee doesn't cover your care Obviously, because it's not capitated, but it would cover that coordination fee. Yeah, right. So you're, if you don't use very much of it, the membership fee is the same. And if you use a lot of care, a lot of services, you're building out your bathroom in one month or one year, it might be more money. But it you're getting be. a lot of work done. Right. And we, yeah. we look at the, the amount of service that you're looking for and how the, mm-hmm. the intensity. So there's, there's different levels of, of service. Now, you all receive the same discount. Mm-hmm. So it could be whatever the discounted scenario is, ten, usually 10 or 20% off what the bill charges are okay, and, and or a fixed price if we can negotiate that as well. So I think that's the piece of really trying to figure out what's going to help someone, but also trying to keep it as modest as possible from a pricing perspective, unless you have someone who just wants a dedicated care advisor and they can have that too. Okay. And then it, it seems like it would pair pretty well with the public side, with, with mm-hmm. the CMS related side. Uh, why did you not launch it in Virginia in the same footprint where you have that? Yeah, so right now, so those are Medicaid lives, and they already have a care manager. 
within okay. the health plan. So, yeah. it was, so you really don't want to duplicate the infrastructure that's already being paid for. Now, however, let's take Medicare Advantage. So how many people want to go to a gym today? Yeah, not, not too many, lot, right? right? So, so you have some of the the, the, the front end pieces for Medicare Advantage that they're that they've been providing. I think this is another option. So, if I ask it, so we did a, we did a study with Consensus Point at one point in time and said, what do people really want? Well, I want help. I want help. Hmm. And so I look at that healthcare as an opportunity. So if you could get healthcare, and then you could do all of these front end services. So I think that's an interesting yeah. option outside of that. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, I'm excited to see to see where it goes, and hopefully, uh, Jumpstart will have a chance to invest eventually. Yeah. <laughs> well, sounds great. Yeah. Uh, so the last thing um, I want to have you talk through is you've been doing this for 20, 25 years on your own, and before that in the health systems. What What do you know now that you wish you knew when you started off in '99? Oh gosh, wow. Um, I think. Yeah, I wish I'd known how hard it was going to be. Yeah, um, uh, but if you'd known that, you might not have done it. So, but uh, you know, outside of that, I think that the, just maintaining the focus on on really the definition of health. So, I think again, I think that I too was caught up in this institutional based health approach. And it wasn't until we started exploring the home and community-based services and all of these other social determinants that how do we really help somebody, the whole person, person-centered, yeah. live a better life? And so I love that. And I think that to me, you know, brought it home. My dad was died about five years ago. Mm. And I thought, you know, this is great, but what he really needed is he needed somebody to help him get home. And yeah. so we got him home, and it was horrible. It was so hard. And I thought, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Is that all this complexity that we've learned, we now need to take this, roll it all together, and make it simple for everybody else. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of the, the, the evolution of where we've gone to now is that how do we make it simple, and how do we make it, you, you talked about this earlier, is for people to understand what they're getting and what's happening and minimize what I call the 25-cent words. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't need to know how smart you are. Just help me understand what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, Nancy, thanks for doing this. I really enjoyed it. It's a huge opportunity in the healthcare space, and so I'm excited to see how it grows. All right, Dick. Thanks so much. Okay, bye.